Our Father, we thank you for the challenges we're receiving from your word and from the lives and interactions around us. We're praying, O oh Lord, that all these interactions and teachings and everything will make indelible mark upon the lives of everyone in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that you open our eyes as we look into the scriptures together again so that you will lead us into the truth you want us to know which will benefit our lives and ministries. In Jesus' name, we pray. In our Bible teaching series, we come to the second chapter of the epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Thessalonians. We looked at chapter 1 yesterday and we saw the foundation of the church and we saw the signs and the evidence of genuine conversion from those ministers of the Lord that were faithful, Paul, Silas, and Timothy. Today we're looking at chapter 2. And we're looking at the Christ-like ministry of godly ministers. Today we're concentrating on their ministry as well as on the description of the lives of these ministers. As we come to chapter 2, the opening verse tells us that they had a fruitful ministry. In chapter 2 verse 1, For ye yourselves, brethren, know, our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain. Paul had an enduring ministry. He had a lasting impact on the church of the Thessalonians. The success of the work was obvious, both to outsiders and insiders, to the people outside the church and to the people within the church. Within the church, already I've read it to you in verse 1. It said, Brethren, you know this, that our coming in unto you was not in vain. In fact, in this uh, chapter, he called upon the believers and he said, You know this, you remember this, you are witnesses to this. Look at it in, the, in verse 2. The middle part of verse 2, as you know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. He told them, he said, hey, nobody is going to fool you, deceive you as to the result of our ministry among you. In verse 5, he said again, neither at any time used with flattering words. Then he called them as witnesses, as ye know. And then in verse 9, he said, For ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail, for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We preached unto you the gospel of God. In verse 13, he still reminds them how they knew this. He said, For this cause also, thank we God without ceasing. Because when ye received the watch of God, which ye had of us, ye received it not as the watch of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh in you also that believe. In fact, as he goes to the end, in verse 20, he just summarizes and he says, For ye are our glory and our joy. So then, to the people inside the church, the believers that he administered to every one of them could testify the effect of the ministry of Paul and his companions upon the Thessalonians. How about the people outside? What did they feel? What did they say about his ministry? Chapter 1, verse 9. For they, the outsiders, for they, the people that are not part of you, they themselves, show forth what manner of entering in we add unto you. How that ye turn to God from idols to serve the living and the true God. Isn't it a wonderful thing when outsiders and insiders, people within, people without, believers and unbelievers can testify about the effect of the ministry of a minister of the Lord. As we look at this chapter, we're going to divide into three parts. Number one, the purity of motives in ministry. It came to the time when the motives of the apostles 
were questioned and challenged. And therefore, he had to write about it, about their method in ministry, the message they gave unto them, and the motives they had that God was a witness to. Number two, parental pictures and model for ministers. He then goes into pictures and he uses mother and father to depict and to describe the ministers and he gives us a model, parental pictures and model for ministers. And then number three, persecuted members and ministers. They suffered persecution just like it happened to other churches in Judea, other churches in Asia Minor, other churches in the New Testament. They also went through persecution and then he brought encouragement unto them. Let's go to number one. Purity of motives in ministry. Look at it now from verse 2. First Thessalonians chapter 2, reading from verse 2. But even after we had suffered before, it said, We were shamefully entreated. As you know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. Persecution, he said. Tribulation, he said. Shamefully entreated, he said. Contention. And then in verse 3, for our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor of guile. There were people that were bringing accusation. Actually, if you know the story of the Thessalonians, after they had preached unto them the word of the Lord, then there was persecution, and they were driven out of the town. But the persecutors saw that the persecution, the humiliation, everything, could not destroy the work of the Lord. They changed their methods. And they began to say, those people had a private agenda. And then they began to accuse these ministers that they came with deceit. They came and there was uncleanness in them. And then they said, it was with guile. I need to tell you that Thessalonica at that time was a very, very bad, obscene, a terrible city. In fact, they were noted for two things. Number one, for crime. Number two, for pornography. For crime, we're told in history that they built their houses literally without any window. They will just build the house just with the door because of the crime. Number two, the pornography, the obscene pictures that were painted on the buildings. It was on almost every building. And uh, things were so bad with them that uh, the people, when they had their children, their form of abortion was that they had the children, they didn't want the children, they leave the children on the streets to die. And so they said, it is no big deal. They are not very different from any of us. As the people have crimes, and the people were obscene and unclean, so the people who came to pray to you were saying they are the same. And they were accusing them, number one, of deceit, number two, of uncleanness, number three of girl look at it number four it says now in verse four but as we were allowed of god to be put in trust with the gospel even so speak we and then he said not as pleasing men but god which also tried our hearts number four they were accused of pleasing men they said everything they did it was the objective it was the goal or the dream of wanting to please men and then in verse 5 now for neither at any time used with flattering words as ye know nor a cloak of covetousness then he said god is witness number five they were accusing them of flattery they said they just flattered you and they wanted they did that so that they could make a gain out of you a lawful gain out of you and then they said there was another thing where we will discover in these people there was covetousness too and then they went on in verse 5 they said no of men sought we glory they were accusing them of self-seeking they must have something in mind there must be something selfish they're looking for. Then he said, neither of you nor yet of others, when we might have been chargeable or burdensome unto you as the apostles of the Lord. And so you see the accusations that came against them. All those accusations challenged their motives. I've told you already, but let me go over number one, deceit. Number two, uncleanness. Number three, girl. You find all that in verse three. And then, number four, pleasing men. 
they challenge them that or they accuse them that all they wanted to do is just to please men for their own and for their own goal number five they accuse them of flattery number six of covetousness number seven of self-seeking number eight of vain glory and as we look at your life and ministry if any of these things are there then your motive is questionable but this is exactly what paul the apostle was answering he said there is nothing of that at all as we look at this uh, section that is the purity of motives in ministry there are five things for us to bring out because uh, we see their purity of motive revealed in these five areas number one they were confident in god's power confident in god's power look at verse 2 again it says for even after that we had suffered before and was shamefully entreated as you know at philippi we were bold in our god notice that persecution was there suffering was there in fact at philippi they were in prison you remember that acts chapter 16 but he said we were bold in our god to keep on speaking unto you the gospel of god with much contention and that's how they came to thessalonica in um, in acts of the apostles chapter 16 acts chapter 16 look at it from verse 40 it says and they went out of the prison the prison at philippi and they entered into the house of lydia and when they had seen the brethren they comforted them and departed as they departed where did they go come to chapter 17 and verse 1 now when they had passed through amphipolis and apollonia they came to thessalonica where was a synagogue of the jews and paul as his manner was went into them went in unto them and three sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures opening and alleging reading and explaining explaining and interpreting that this christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead and that this jesus whom i preach unto you is christ and some of them believed and consorted with paul and silas and of the devout greeks a great multitude and of the chief women not a few that's how the ministry to Snyka took place persecution yes the preaching of the word also tribulation yes the teaching of the word of god also humiliation yes the, the, the honesty to carry on the work of the lord as well and so he said we were bold in our god notice number one then when you look at the motive of a preacher the motive of the people that are saying to minister the word of god there is the confidence in god's power and then you put in front of that tenacity that's what gave them tenacity because they were confident in their God and they kept on on the job, on the work they had been given to do. Number two, they were committed to God's truth. Committed to God's truth. Come back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. He said, no we had something in mind no we had a purpose in mind no there was a motive within we were committed to god's truth and actually he emphasized that in second corinthians chapter 2 and verse 17 chapter 2 verse 17 in second uh, corinthians chapter 2 verse 17 for we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. He said, we didn't corrupt the word of God. We stayed on that word of God. We were committed to God's truth. The first one, they were uh, confident in God's power, tenacity. The second one, committed to God's truth, that is integrity. They had integrity because they kept to the word of the Lord. The exhortation was not of deceit. That means no error, no false doctrine. It was not based on uncleanness. Their messages never defended in any way moral lapses. 
and it was not in guile, a pretending or hypocritical approach. He and his companions were committed to the preaching of the truth without adulteration, without watering down the demands of the gospel of God. He also lived by the truth he preached. He had integrity of character. Number three, they were committed, they were commissioned rather, commissioned by God's will. In uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, reading now in verse 4. The first part of verse 4, it says, But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak. He said, we were commissioned uh, by God's will. He said, we were permitted of God. We were allowed of God. We were put into the ministry by God himself. Because of that consciousness, ye have not chosen me, I have chosen you. I put you in the ministry that you will go forth and do my will and preach my word and bear fruit and bear much fruit. The consciousness of that made them to understand they needed to be faithful unto the Lord. And as Paul was writing unto Timothy later in 1 Timothy chapter 1, reading from verse 11 and verse 12. He said, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. He knew that this thing was committed to him. He knew he got it from the Lord. And then he said, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me, for in that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. You remember number one, they were confident of God's power. That's tenacity. And then, number two, they were committed to God's truth, integrity. Number three, commissioned by God's will, authority. That gave them authority because the new day's commission is not for man. The Lord himself had appointed them. It was not a self-appointment called commissioned by God. Under God's authority, they were able to proclaim the gospel of the Lord with authority as well. Number four compelled by God's knowledge. They knew that God knew them, and God knew their heart, and God was trying their hearts, and because of that knowledge of God, that he knew that he will know their motives. If they preached anything, he will know why they were saying what they were saying. He said, because of that, there is a compelling force. There is something compelling us. That is the knowledge of God about us within and without, compelled by God's knowledge. That is accountability. It makes us accountable because we know God is watching. Because we know God is looking at everything. Because we know within, without, in the secret, in the public, he knows everything that makes us accountable. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. I read now from verse 4, latter part of verse 4. Not as pleasing men, no, but God which tries our hearts. He examines everything. He scrutinizes everything. And then it says, For neither at any time used we flattering words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness. God is witness. Because God sees, because God knows, because God examines, because God tries our hearts, because God is scrutinizing everything, because of that, there is accountability. We are compelled by God's knowledge. That's why himself, that's why he said later at another time, in Galatians chapter 1, Galatians chapter 1, still under the conviction that God knows everything, God sees everything, God examines everything, and therefore we need to be accountable. Galatians chapter 1, reading from verse 10, it says, For do I now persuade men, or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. He said, we're all the time looking at God, and we're all the time looking at what God is looking at, and is watching our heart. He knows our motive. He knows why we do what we do. Because of that, there is accountability. A preacher uh, some time ago, a uh, few years ago, was interviewed. 
uh, by these uh, media people and they asked him a question. Why do you say what you say? Why do you approach things the way you approach things? And then at the end of the whole thing, they asked him the last question. They said, whenever you prepare your message, who do you prepare your message for? What they were expecting him to answer is, I prepare my message for my congregation. I look at the people that are hurting. I look at the people that are ignorant. I look at the people that need this. I look at the people that need that. And then I prepare my message so as to feed their need. He didn't answer that way. He said, I prepare my message for God. I prepare my message. I give it to God. And I say, God, there is it. Is that what you want to say to your people? And he said, if I have the approval of God, that that is what he wants at that hour, at that time, for his people, that's all. I prepare my message for God to scrutinize, for God to look at, because we are compelled by God's knowledge. Because we are preparing the message, we are preparing what we are doing for God himself to approve. We are not looking for the approval of men. And that's a challenge to every one of us that as you are preaching the word, as you come before the congregation, you know that God is watching everything, and you know that God is your witness, and you know that God is going to judge you on the final day. Therefore, number one, you understand that you have to have confidence in God's power. That gives you tenacity. Whatever the persecution, whatever the problem, you are able to stay on the job because God is with you. Number two, you are committed to God's truth, unchanging truth, infallible truth. It remains ever the same. Integrity. Number three, you are commissioned by God's will. And no man takes this honor unto himself, but such as is called by God. God as Aaron was and therefore you understand it's not a man putting you there it's not a man commissioning you you are commissioned by God's will that gives you authority number four you are compelled by God's knowledge gives you accountability number five you are consumed with God's glory consumed with God's glory what does that give you it gives you humility Consumed by God's glory, look at it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and in verse 6. Chapter 2 verse 6, Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you, nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. It says we know we are ambassadors of Christ, we are sent once by Christ, there is somebody behind us that sent us and he even gets there before us before we get there and because we are sent by him we are not sent we didn't send ourselves there is just one thing we're looking for and one thing we're aiming for and one thing we're, we're going for it is being consumed with God's glory I'm asking you the question are you just like that that you're not looking for anything and you're not asking for anything all you have all you desire is that the glory of god alone is the thing that consumes you it's a passion of your life in second corinthians chapter four second corinthians chapter four reading there from verse five it says for we preach not ourselves we preach not ourselves no Paul you don't have to and you don't even need to there is so much in the divine library of the Word of God in all these 66 books of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and you cannot you can hardly finish a chapter in one single message there are so many verses there are so many chapters there is deep revelation it was given by inspiration all that man needs for salvation all that man needs for sanctification all that man needs for glory all that man needs from the time he hears the first syllable of the gospel until he hears the last syllable of the gospel that will make him pass unto glory. All that man will need for body, for soul, for spirit, everything is contained in the divine library. We don't need to preach ourselves. Neither do we need to preach other people. The word of God is sufficient and the word of God is enough. And therefore, we are not preaching ourselves. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, I'm reading, it says we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. 
You understand there, number one. We have looked at what Paul the Apostle was emphasizing, the purity of motives in ministry. Purity of motives in ministry. I go to point number two. Parental pictures and model for ministers. Parental pictures and model for ministers. I'm looking at it now from verse 7. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. But we were gentle among you, as even as a nurse cherishes her children. So, being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because ye were dear unto us. Here we have Paul the Apostle, and he's giving us a picture now. You will see the picture he gives us. He tells us in verse 7, We are gentle among you, even as a nurse cherishes her children. Let me explain that word, nurse. Because if you don't understand, you may have a wrong notion. The notion you may have, you may think it's a midwife, a nurse. No, that's not it. Because it says, as a nurse cherishes her own children. In the original Greek, it says her own children. That's a mother. Also, if you are not careful, you may think he's talking of an attendant in a daycare center. That's not it. He's not talking of an attendant in a daycare center. He's talking about a mother having our own children and he said this is a picture of a real leader a real leader is someone that is like a mother and he has the care he has the concern he has the compassion of a mother over her own baby but he has another picture and this other picture he gives us in verse 11 he said as you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his children again he says a father having children there is a responsibility of that father over the children we look at the leader then and we see the parental pictures for the leader and this gives us the model for ministers on the one hand is a mother on the other hand is a father as well let's look at isaiah chapter 66 Isaiah chapter 66 verse 13 looking at the picture of the leader as a mother what's the implication of that what does that tell us about a pastor about a leader in the church in uh, Isaiah 66 verse 13 as one whom his mother comforted so will I comfort you and ye shall be comforted in Jerusalem even God Almighty pictures himself there as a mother and he will comfort the children of Israel as a mother will comfort the children. In the New Testament in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, reading from verse 15. For though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ... Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Here Paul the apostle says, the pastor or the leader is also like a father. And he's uh, talking of a father here, not just like a school teacher, not just like somebody that has gone to an institution and he has got some knowledge and he wants to pass the knowledge to some students or some disciples, some people that want to learn. He's talking of an intimate relationship of a children to the father as we look at those uh, two pictures let's then pick them let's pick them up one by one and see what paul the apostle is telling us about the life of the minister about a model for the minister about the activities and responsibilities of a minister let of a minister let's start from verse 7 of first thessalonians chapter 2 but we were gentle among you even as a nursing, a nursing mother cherishes her children, her own children, number one, is being gentle. Like a mother, you are gentle to the congregation. That means you are kind, 
That means you are tender. That means you are concerned. That means you are caring. That means you are as patient as a mother will do to the children. The very first thing that you are asking yourself is in, that, in your leadership. Are you gentle like that? In your leadership, are you so committed like that that you are caring and you are tender, tenderly concerned for them? Number two, it said in verse 8, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not just the gospel of God only, but also our own souls because ye were dear unto us. It's telling us that as a children, babies will be very dear to the mother. Even so, members of the congregation will be very dear and precious to those ministers. Number two then, aff being affectionately desirous of the members of the church. Yearning over them with the love of a real mother. And then number three, the willingness to impart the gospel of God unto them as a mother will be willing, will be ready to regularly give the life, giving life, sustaining milk from a very body uh, unto the children. It means then that ministry will cost you something as caring for children will cause something from the mother. You are giving something. You are giving something. And then you are very, very careful what comes into you because it is what comes into you that will get into the children. Even uh, medical science, they tell us, while those mothers are pregnant and they're expecting children, if they have been on drugs, if they have been smoking, and if they have been drinking, they want them, they tell them, because a lot of things can get into the children even before they are born. And then when the children are born, if there is anything in the mother that is not going to help uh, the child, as the milk is coming from the mother onto the child, the medical people will warn those mothers isn't that a lesson for us because it is what you read it is what you hear it is what you take in all those things were picking up here and picking up there if they are contaminated and it gets into you then the, the fountain is spoiled and the fountain is contaminated and it gets to the children you are willing to impart therefore not just the gospel of God only but your, your very source that's number four the willingness to impart our own soul unto them that we are not thinking of ourselves we are not thinking of our own need we're so willing like a mother that for their salvation for their spiritual growth because they are dear and precious unto us we're willing to give everything number five they labored and they traveled night and day look at it in verse nine for ye remember brethren our labor and travail and for laboring night and day, because we will not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. He said, we labor and we travail. That means it's a costly exertion. That is, you exert yourself, you labor, even to the point of exhaustion and tiredness. It is the labor of love that, that results in that travail, indicating hardship, intensity of their work. Number six, because we will not be chargeable, we will not be chargeable to any of you, laboring without expecting anything from them. Like a mother will give herself, give everything without expecting anything from the baby. That's one side of the leader. Let's look at the other side of the leader. That's a picture now of a father. In First Thessalonians chapter two, reading from verse ten, for ye are witnesses. And God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. You see those three adverbs there? It says, holily, justly, unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. And if you have studied Paul the Apostle, eh, sometimes he likes to go in triads. That means eh, three things, triangle, three triads. And it says here, number one, holy lay. That is, in the presence of God. God can see into our hearts. He can see into our behavior. He can see the inner motive. He can see the spirit. He can see the attitude. Before him, before God, there is holiness. Number two, justly. 
that's before God and man. As God looks at us, he sees that we are just. He sees there is no partiality. He sees that anything we do, any interaction we have with people, with any individual, with any group of people, it is just. Even the people themselves, they can see how just we are. There is no tribalism and there is nothing that will show we are preferring this one to the other one. And then number three, before men, unblameable, living above reproach we behaved ourselves among you that believe why did they do that because they knew that the message they gave will be destroyed if they didn't live the life that will support the message and that means then the believer and you know sometimes you may have a person that preaches so well in fact uh, uh, somebody said about a particular preacher he says when he's in the pulpit the people feel that he should never come out of the pulpit and then they said when he's out of the pulpit the people feel as if he should never come back to the pulpit that is when he's there, he delivers the message, and you'll think this is great, this is marvelous, this is like an orator. When he's in there, he talks. When he's out there, the behavior, the character is so contradicting the message that the people feel he should never go back to the pulpit again. Paul the Apostle didn't want anything like that. He wanted the life to want it to match the ministry. What he said to match what he did. That's why he said, God is witness. And you Thessalonians, you are witnesses. So you know our lives. You know our behavior. You know our responses. You know our reactions. You know us inside out. We didn't live in a secluded place. For you not to know how we behaved. We behaved ourselves among you. Number one, holily. Number two, justly. Number three, unblameably. Among you that believe. And then in verse 11, as you know, how we exalted and comforted and charged a triad again. Three of them again. We exalted you. We comforted you. We charged every one of you as a father does his children that ye would walk worthy of God who has called you unto his kingdom and glory. Let me summarize that part before I move on to point number three. There are two sides of leadership. On the one side, the leader is like a mother. On the other side, the leader is like a father. And it is that balance in leadership that actually makes a leader what God wants him to be. So I say that way. On the one hand, there is the care and the kindness of a mother. On the other hand, there is the control of a father. Where it's only care and kindness, it won't be a good ministry. Where it's only control, it will not be a good ministry. But where you have the balance of the mother and the father's side, there is a care and a kindness. On the one hand, there is a control on the other hand. Number two, there is affection, the affection of a mother. On the one hand, on the other hand, there is the authority of a father. There is the side of affection. There is a side of authority. Number three, there is the embracing of a mother. On the other hand, there is the exhortation of a father. And you see, it's the balance of leadership. In church, leadership, or even leadership of any kind, yes, you embrace. There is a touch. There is the human side of it. There is a sympathizing side of it. But on the other hand, there is the exhortation, charging them and telling them this is the direction to go. Now, Number four, on the one hand, there is cherishing. That's what a mother does. The mother will cherish that child and love that child. On the other hand, there's a challenge of the father. It's the father that says there's a goal, and there is a dream, and there is a destination, and there is, a, there is something you need to attain. Yes, there is cherishing on the one hand. On the other hand, there is challenging. Number five, there is traveling in prayer. On one hand, on the other hand, there is a teaching of precepts. Paul the Apostle in every letter, I'm praying for you. I remember you in prayer. I make mention of you in prayer. Yes, that's traveling in prayer. But that same Paul the Apostle, he wasn't only on his knees. He was on his feet teaching the people the teaching of precepts. Number six, on the one hand, there is the demonstration 
of holiness and justice and an unblameable life. On the other hand, there is a demand through exhortation that you too should follow our steps because we are following the steps of Christ. That's the balance that the Lord is expecting that every leader will have and manifest. I come now to point number three. Persecuted members and ministers. Persecuted members and ministers. I come to verse 13 now. It says in verse 13, For this cause also, thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the watch of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the watch of men, but as it is in truth, the watch of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. You, you see the emphasis, in the emphasis on the ministry was the word. And then he said, when you received the word, you received it not as the words of men. You received it as the word of God. But I received, as they received the word, it had an impact on them. It had an effect on them. What effect, what impact did it have on them? Look at it in verse 14. It says, for ye, brethren, be, be, became followers of the churches of God, which are in Judea, uh, which in Judea and in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things also of your own countrymen, even as they of the Jews. For both who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us and they please not God but are contrary and are contrary to all men. He said, when you receive the word, first you receive the word in much contention. The, the persecution started with the ministers. They persecuted the people that were giving out the word. Then when the people received the word, those who rejected the word persecuted those who received the word. Uh, have you noticed that in your preaching? Have you noticed that in your ministry? Because there are one or two, there, there is one or two, of two things that people will do. You preach the word. On the one side, they receive. On the other side, they reject. Have you noticed that preaching divides the people into two camps? This side believing, that side rejecting. And then you'll find opposition, then you'll find contradiction, then you'll find persecution. And the people that reject will persecute the people that receive. And it was so in their own case that the Thessalonians, the people that received the word, they were enjoying the benefit of the word because the word was effectually working in them. But the people that rejected the word, they had nothing to do with the word. They were in the congregation not to receive but to reject. And those who rejected and something they did, they persecuted those who received. Come to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17, reading from verse 5. But the Jews which believed not, that's it, they rejected. They were moved, they moved with envy. And two unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city in an opera, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. And so persecution ensued. But praise the Lord for these Thessalonian believers, those who really believed, they stood by the word. Then in verse 16, it says, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles, that they might be saved, to fill up their sins always, for the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. It says, but we brethren, being taken from you because of the persecution for a short time, in presence, not in heart, we are always thinking about you. Because you are dear unto us, because you are glory and our joy, we endeavored more abundantly to see your face with great desire. And then he said in verse 18, Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. Paul was not saying that he was being attacked by Satan. That's what some people say. They say, you know, even Paul the apostle, he had attack of evil spirit. They say even Paul the apostle, he had affliction of evil. No, nothing like that. 
Because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. What was he saying? He was simply saying that he wanted to come to them. There were some physical circumstances orchestrated by the devil that hindered them. It had nothing to do with his spirit. It had nothing to do with his mind. It had nothing to do with his brain. It had nothing to do with depression. It had nothing to do with any physical sickness. Just a, a physical hindrance out there that didn't allow him to go over there when he wanted to. But all the same he said in verse 19 he said, for what is our hope or joy or even a crown of rejoicing are ye not even in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ as at the come at his coming he said for ye are our glory and our joy every time you remember the work that he had done in Thessalonica he was always happy because he said it is just like a model of any other church and what we like to see the church at Philippi the church at Thessalonica if all the churches we have gone to plant if they can be like that that's our glory and that's our joy and that's the reward of the ministry that the Lord has given us. What made that difference in Thessalonica? What made that church to be that kind of church? And what is going to make your ministry the kind of a ministry that we see in Thessalonica? It comes to a verse 13 as I come to a conclusion. Look at that verse 13 again. It says, for, for this cause also, thank we God, without ceasing, because when ye received the watch of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the watch of men, but as it is in truth, the watch of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. There's something that is significant in the ministry of Paul the Apostle. Listen to this. He concentrated on the world. And if you are going to see the same result that Paul the Apostle saw in Thessalonica, concentrate on the world. Be very careful. Don't allow the message of communication to swallow up the message being communicated. Many times, you'll find that a person has the message, but he has forgotten that what we're passing on is the message and they allow the method of communication to swallow up the message they want to communicate. But Paul the Apostle will have none of that. He knew the message. We preach Christ. Christ the Savior. Christ the Sanctifier. Christ the Healer. Christ our all in all. And that message is central. And you are not going to allow the method of communication to swallow up uh, the message itself. Put it this way. There are some preachers, they love illustrations. Illustrations are good. When those illustrations are in their place. But you do not want illustration to replace interpretation. Illustration does not save. Illustration, in fact, many times, you will remember the illustration that a preacher has given. You will forget the word. You will forget the text. And you will not have the proper interpretation of the text. You know what Paul the Apostle did? He looked at Jesus Christ. He looked at the Old Testament. He said, this is a Christ. And he said, this Jesus is a Christ who are preaching unto you. Who is to save your soul? You want to be careful, therefore, that as you are preaching the word, you bring in illustration, but you do not allow illustration to replace interpretation. And the word he gave unto them, it worked in them tremendously. What does that mean, number one? It saved them. Number two, it reproves, it corrects, it trains us in righteousness. Number three, it makes us grow up, desire the sincere milk of the word that she may grow. Number four, it purges us, you are clean through the word which have spoken unto you. Number five, it sanctifies us, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. It warns us 
by them, that is by your word, by your statutes, your servants are one. Number seven, it strengthens us. When the word of God comes in, it's like spiritual meat and spiritual food. You are strengthened. Number eight, it counsels us. Number nine, it revives us. Number ten, it makes us fruitful because his delight is in the law of his God. In that law does he meditate day and night. And then it says, whatsoever he does will prosper. He will bear fruit. And then number eleven, it makes us wise. That's what makes you whiter than all your teachers. And then number number twelve, it perfects us. It equips us because the Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration. And then we're told it is is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. That's why Paul the Apostle in writing to Timothy, he said, Timothy, do you remember our time in Thessalonica? Uh, the thing that really worked in Thessalonica, and why we had a good ministry, a good result in Thessalonica, is because of the word. He said, Timothy, I'm passing it unto you, therefore preach the word. Be instant in season, and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But then after their loss, they will hear to themselves, teachers have been itching ears, and they will be turned away from the truth, and they will turn unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. The only way you do that, keep to the word. Read the word to them, interpret the word to them, apply the word to them, give the word a chance to work effectually in their hearts and lives. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord that God will help us to do that very thing. God will help us to do that very thing. Emphasize the word. Preach the word. Stand on the word. Don't let illustrations become too many that we forget the interpretation of the word. Don't let your message swallow up, overshadow the message you are trying to give. Give them the word. It will effectually work in them. Please open your mouth and pray.